Hey guys, it's Lotus, and welcome back to another video. Today, we're going to continue on with our read-along of Urha. Let's jump right into it. Chapter 108, Shijun's Earth Soul Moran followed him upstairs without any idea what's going on, the worn-out wooden stairs beneath his feet creaking with every step. He couldn't resist asking, You call him Sir Chu? That's right, Lord Yan Lo himself sent him to manage this place. He is our superior. Dot dot dot. Moran was surprised, but said nothing about it. Here we are. The masked person stopped in front of a half moon shaped door on the second floor and knocked lightly on the carved vermilion door that wasn't completely closed. Sir Chu, there's an acquaintance of yours looking for you. There was a beat of silence. Then a voice came from the inside, gentle like warm wine on the stove. Soft hair by the pillow. An acquaintance? Him again? I already said I don't want to see him ever again. You can tell him to leave. The masked person cleared his throat and said, No, Sir Chu misunderstood. It's not him this time. But who else is there? A moment of silence, and then, no matter, come in. The room was simple and elegant, and the furnishings were so plain that it seemed a little bare but the floor was covered by a soft, luxurious rug. Moran's foot sunk into the rug when he stepped inside, and there was a whiff of the sharp smell of furs in the air, completely at odds with the smell of the person currently standing by the window, pruning a flower branch. His long, inky black hair draped loosely down his white robes and sweeping sleeves, and the vividly red flower buds quivered lightly where they were held between his delicate fingertips. Maybe it was, maybe it was the rule here at Tailwind Hall but he also wore a dark blue mask with bared fangs and bulging eyes. Yet, worn on his face, even such a ferocious looking mask somehow managed to look gentler. He trimmed off the excess branches, gathered them up and discarded them before finally turning around. Moran's throat felt dry. The exchange between the masked person and Chua Ning just now left him at a complete loss and feeling vaguely uneasy. He didn't know what it was that this soul had lost, if Chua Ning didn't remember him... Just as he was fretting, the man put down the pruning shears and walked toward him. Moran, he, Moran, he who was... Moran, he who was undaunted by the heavens and the earth, found himself flustered and agitated, sweat covering his back. Shudrun! The man stopped walking, coming to a stop close by. Moran heard something like a chuckle from him. Shudrun, he said. Perhaps the little Gongzi got the wrong person? As he thought, just what he was afraid of. Moran's heart dropped like an enormous rock into an endless abyss, dragging him all the way down. He stared at the man before him at a complete loss for what to say. Seeing no response from him, the person placed his pale, slender hand over the boldly painted mask and took it off, revealing an elegant and composed face beneath. Moran felt like thousand-pound rock disappear in an instant. I was right! He stared at the unmasked man, astonished but without the slightest hint of doubt, and, blur and blurted out, Chu Shun? I was right! I was thinking, what if the what if Sir Chu wasn't Chu Ning, but Chu Shun? Okay. No wonder the person downstairs had mistaken the portrait. Chu Shun and Chu Ning looked eight parts alike to start with, except that Chu Shun was gentler and Chu Ning was colder, but only someone extremely familiar would be able to tell the difference. Someone like Moran. The person before him now was indeed the Gongzi of Lin'an City that he had seen in the illusion of 200 years ago. Chu Shun, so he had blurted out his name without thinking. But the real Chu Shun had never met him before, and he was surprised as he said with a smile, You actually do know me? Moran hurriedly waved his hand. Oh, no, no, I got the wrong person, but I do also know you. He peered curiously at the other person as he spoke. Chu Shun had died hundreds of years ago, but had still yet to be reborn, seemingly due to the tasks assigned to him by Yan Lo, allowing him to, to temporarily exist outside of the cycle of reincarnation. Meeting Chu Ning's ancestor was the last thing that Moran had expected. He found the experience quite bizarre. Chu Shun nodded and said, I see. Then he continued with a smile, Whom is the little Gongzi looking for? Since fate brought you up these stairs, I will help you search. Else, who knows how long it might take you to find this person, with the size of Nanka Town and all the millions of ghosts in it? 
Moran was originally going to quickly explain things and then go back downstairs to have the divination redone, but he hadn't expected Chu Shun, as warm-hearted and deaf as he was in life, to offer to personally help him. He accepted the offer joyfully. I'd appreciate that, Sir Chu. Thank you. He handed the portrait over as he spoke. Chu Shun unfolded it and took a look, then smiled. No wonder the person downstairs, no wonder the people downstairs were mistaken. He really does look quite like me. What's his name? Chu Wan Ning, Moran said. His name is Chu Wan Ning. His surname is also Chu? What a coincidence. Moran's heart leapt, and he asked, Could he be related to you? Not sure. You have to go to the Ninth Ghost King to look into things in the living world. I have a death grudge against the Ninth King and refuse to beg him for any favors, so I know nothing of matters in the living world. The Ghost King in question was, of course, the one that broke through the barrier at Linan and killed his entire family back then. Bringing up an old scar like this, even someone so composed as him couldn't help the complicated expression on his face. Moran thought he could use this opportunity to confirm the relationship between Chua Ning and Chu Shun, but unexpectedly ran into this and could only shake his head. That's a pity. Chu Shun smiled a little and said nothing as he went to fetch a gold-plated yin-yang pattern compass from the shelf, then invited Moran to take a seat. This thing can tell us where he is? Eight, nine times out of ten. What about the remaining one or two times? The energy of some people's souls can be strange sometimes, so there's a possibility it can't be located, Chu Shun explained. But that's rare. The little Gongzi probably isn't that unlucky. With the divination set up, the little golden needle inside the compass pointed shakily toward the north, but a little while later swiveled to point south, then suddenly east, suddenly west, and in the end settled on spinning round and round. Chu Shun, dot dot dot. Moran asked cautiously, So what does that mean? Ahem. <clears throat> Chu Shun cleared his throat, looking a little embarrassed. The little Gongzi is indeed that unlucky. Moran, dot dot dot. Truth be told, Moran's always had rather bad luck, so he just knew it wouldn't go this smoothly. He sighed and thanked Chu Shun, then made to go back into the sea of people to keep looking for Chu Ning. But just then, the compass suddenly stopped spinning madly, its needle pointing shakily in a certain direction as if it wasn't too sure, then a moment later, nudged to the side a little bit more. Chu Shun hurriedly called, Little Gongzi, hang on! Moran paused immediately, holding his breath as he stood by the table and stared at the compass. The needle swiveled left and right, refusing to hold still, but more or less pointing out a general direction. Chu Shun furrowed his brows and said, What's going on? Is that weird? Not so much weird, but it is rather strange. Chu Shun gazed at the compass, his brows furrowing even more. He seems to be in two directions? Moran was startled. How could that be? Right now, the, cogniz the cognizant soul was in Chu Wanning's body. The human soul was inside the soul calling lantern, which means there should only be just the one earth soul left in the underworld. So how could Chu Wanning appear in two places simultaneously? Chu Shun continued, In any case, there's one to the southeast and one to the northeast. The little Gongzi should go check in both directions. It's possible that the compass was affected by some kind of magic and couldn't pinpoint the right location. Filled with anxiety, Moran thanked Chu Shun and hurried out of Tailwind Hall, headed eastward. He ran for a long while, but his footsteps were abruptly halted by a fork in the road. Southeast or northeast? He held up the so-calling lantern anxiously, but a little while later, as he stared at the lantern in his hand that held the human soul, he suddenly felt some kind of a strange, vague feeling in his heart. Following this feeling that seemed to, vacilli that to vacillate between drawing closer and, and retreating, he walked along narrow roads and dark alleys. The feeling became more distinct the further he went. He felt he even felt like Chuan Ning's earth soul was calling the lantern in his hand, or rather, calling him toward a certain place. Moran finally came to a stop in front of an old wooden building that was two stories tall. Ailing Soul Sanitarium! He looked up, gaze sweeping across the large, heavy-looking plaque above the door. The plaque's black paint had peeled off from so long in the sun and wind, and the raised lettering had also lost most of its red paint, revealing the molding, decaying wood underneath. Moran frowned, heart tremoring in his chest. 
These three words made him feel uneasy. Ailing souls? What does that mean? Is this why Chu Shun's compass didn't work? He pushed open the door and went in, stepping over a tall threshold. He found his answers soon enough. There were hundreds of beds inside, with unconscious souls lying on them. A dozen odd ghosts wearing white masks were going around channeling spiritual energy to those on the sick beds. This so-called ailing soul sanitarium was the underworld's infirmary. Moran found the ghost doctor overseeing things in the inner section and cupped his hands respectfully toward him, saying, Doctor, I... The doctor was very busy and said impatiently, Prescription pickups on second floor. Examination queue is on the left. Then where do I go if I'm looking for someone? Looking for someone's over at... Huh? Looking for someone? Moran showed him the portrait. Have you seen him? The ghost doctor took the painting and looked it over, then looked back up at Moran. Under the holes in the mask, there was pity in his eyes. Your relative? Mm, yes. His earth soul is damaged. The ghost doctor pointed toward the stairs. He's in the innermost partition compartment upstairs. This kind of illness is untreatable. We can only delay it for the time being. You should go see him. Moran started. Damaged? Damaged how? Who knows? The cycle of reincarnation is an agonizing thing. It's possible his soul was damaged during his last couple of reincarnations. Or, since he was a cultivator in this life, maybe he had a chi deviation that damaged his soul. Either way, it's no longer whole. How am I supposed to know how it happened? Maran asked apprehensively. Then, then would a damaged earth soul affect anything? Affect? The ghost doctor thought for a moment. It's not a huge issue, since it's only one of three souls that's incomplete, so it won't affect his ability to reincarnate. If anything, in the next life, he'll probably have a shorter lifespan, poorer luck, or a weaker constitution. Dot dot dot. Moran was reluctant to accept that, but there was nothing to be done about it, so we could only thank the ghost doctor and head upstairs. It was less densely packed upstairs than it had been downstairs, which was so crowded it was hard to breathe. Maybe because the souls here were those that could not be revived, so there wasn't much of a need to watch over them. But there was only one doctor in the entrance hall, napping leisurely on a rattan chair. Moran left him alone and headed straight inside. Such a big space, but there were only ten, twenty sick beds laid out next to the rosewood windows, partitioned off with white screens in between. It was dead silent. The floor creaked beneath his feet. Moran's eyes landed on the innermost compartment. It was next to a half-moon-shaped door, outside of which was an open balcony. The moonlight poured in through a thin layer of silk curtain that drifted in the breeze. There were twenty-odd sick souls here, yet for some reason, Moran had an intense awareness of exactly where to go. Perhaps it was the soul-calling lantern showing him the way, but he walked directly to the innermost compartment without so much as a sideways glance, coming to a stop in that pure, hazy moonlight. He lifted the curtain. The last piece of Chuaning's soul lay there. His eyes were closed and his face colorless looking just like the body resting at Frost Sky Hall. Despite having found him, despite the hope of rebirth now being within reach, Moran still couldn't help the ache in his chart and the stinging in his nose as he gazed at that frail, blood-stained figure. He walked over and set the soul-calling lantern down by the bedside. Then he sat down on the bed, wanting to gently hold the other's ice-cold hand. But this soul was different from the human soul from before. Maybe because the damage was too severe, but his body was actually incorporeal. Moran couldn't touch Chiwaning's earth soul, his fingers passing right through him to land on the clean white sheets. Such incorporeality left Moran feeling unbearably lost and pained. If something had gone wrong, if Master Huai Zui hadn't come, if Chiwaning's soul had been just slightly more damaged, if Shijun had despaired and refused to see him, he bent down and thought he knew he wouldn't be able to lay his forehead. Oh, he bent down, and though he knew he wouldn't be able to lay his forehead against Chu Ning's, he still couldn't help closing his eyes and leaning over the bed like he was embracing that faint, frail earth soul. Shu Jun! He overlapped with his soul, the moonlight spilling over him, indistinct and indistinguishable. Moran let out a long exhale and a sigh, but his heart was heavy and bitter. He had seen Chu Ning's body, then his earth soul. Wait, he had seen Chu Ning's body, then his human soul and now the sickly earth soul, and felt something different upon seeing each. He had knelt before the body, his sins and his guilt nearly tearing him apart. 
he had repented before the human soul and held his hand as he begged him to return. But the earth soul, he tried to hold him, yet he couldn't reach him, couldn't touch him. He suddenly felt a bottomless dread that this was what he deserved. He was laden with so many sins, his hands were covered in blood. What merit? What right did he have to accompany him by his side again, to stay by his side? Moran kept his eyes closed, the wetness on his eyelashes soaked into the flimsy pillow. He once thought that the heavens were unkind to him, but that seemed to him such an absurd joke now. That wasn't the case at all. It turned out that the heavens were very kind to him. It was his own heart that was unkind that made everything seem dark and gloomy. He was wrong. He suddenly realized that he at once walked the road of no return. He wanted, to he wanted to turn back. He wanted to use the rest of his life to make up for it. Use the rest of his life to pay it back. He didn't know if that would be enough to go back to the start. Forget Ta Xianjun. Forget Emperor of the Human Realm. He didn't want any of it. He wanted only to lead a proper life. To be the kind of righteous person that Chuaning had always wanted him to be. People, saying that recogni people say that recognizing your mistakes and changing for the better was the most important part. But he had sinned so deeply. He didn't know how long it would take to make up for it. Perhaps he'll never be able to escape this endless remorse, even until the day he dies. After all, a scar cut into the waters could return to evenness, but a wound stabbed into a tree would always be there. Shi Jun. After a long time immersed in the light of the moon, immersed in Chua Ning's nearly see-through soul, he said in a voice like he, as he said in a voice like he was coaxing a child, "Come on, let's go home." He straightened up and picked up the soul calling lantern. He recited the incantation silently, and the earth soul went inside, the faint silhouette disappearing into the lantern in no time. Moran waited. He waited for a long while until the earth soul and the human soul had merged completely into one, and then he waited some more. But still, nothing happened. Moran's face paled. What happened? Wasn't he supposed to be able to bring Chuaning back to the living world once the Earth Soul and the Human Soul had merged? Was Master Huaizui's spell not working? End of chapter 108. So, to recap, it turns out that Sir Chu is actually Chu Shun. I was correct. Um, I don't know what Chu Shun is doing there, though. He died over 200 years ago, yet he's been stuck here in the underworld and hasn't reincarnated yet which means he hasn't been able to reunite with his son and his wife either. I wonder what Chu Shun is, uh, what kind of task he has to do here. Um, he's really respected by the people that work in the underworld though, so he has a pretty high position. He was given this position by Yan Lo, right? But yeah, um, Chu Shun is able to help Moran figure out the general idea of where Shi Jun's earth soul is located by using a compass. Um, and he makes it to the sanitarium uh, for sick and ailing souls. And he finds Chuaning's soul that is incorporeal, it's see-through, he can't touch it, and he's really sick and faintly. So, um, he isn't doing so well. Uh, I don't, he couldn't even respond to Moran when Moran called out to him. So, Moran was able to, uh, merge the earth soul and the human soul, but for some reason, Chuaning still hasn't returned. That probably means that his earth soul is probably uh, split apart. That's not his full soul. Um, because as we saw, the compass was spinning like crazy and pointed in two different directions. Uh, so that means he still has to go somewhere else to probably find the rest of Shi Jun's soul. Okay, let's continue. Chapter 109, Shi Jun's second earth soul. Ah, uh, yeah, <laughs> I didn't even read the title of the chapter. It says right here, his second earth soul. So his earth soul got split in half. Head numb and thoughts a jumble of white noise, Moran's hands and feet felt like ice as he hugged Chuaning's soul to himself and went back downstairs in a daze. Doctor! You again? What is it this time? You're sure that the one upstairs is my Shijun's earth soul, right? The ghost doctor was rather annoyed. Of course it is! I wouldn't get something like that wrong! Still refusing to give up, Moran tried again. C could it be the cognizant soul or... Or what? The ghost doctor tissed. A person has three souls, earth, cognizance, and human. I've already practiced here for 150 years. If I can't even tell the three souls apart, your Yan Lo would have kicked me back into the wheel of reincarnation long ago. Moran pressed his lips together. Then an uncertain thought occurred to him. Doctor, in your 150 years here, have you ever seen anyone with 
two Earth souls? What's wrong with you? The ghost doctor snapped crossly. Looks to me like your head's not working right. Maybe you should let me take your pulse. Of course he couldn't let the ghost doctor actually take his pulse. Master Huai Zui may have cast an enchantment on him, but if he wasn't careful, he could probably still be get found out. He could, he could probably still get found out. So Moran offered a hasty apology and fled out of the ailing soul sanitarium, holding the lantern with the human and earth souls inside. It was always dim in the ghost realm. The only way to tell day from night was to look up at the sky. If there was a lukewarm sun behind the layer of murky mist and heavy red clouds, then it was day. If a cold moon hung high above, then it was night. It was night right now, and the roads were slowly emptying out. Holding the soul-calling lantern in his arms, Moran walked through the streets by himself with his head lowered. He didn't know what to do, and the more he walked, the more helpless and alone he felt. Such helplessness and uncertainty had once been a daily part of his childhood. Having to face these feelings once again now unsettled him. He remembered the people he used to know back when he was getting by at the pleasure house. The house of drunken jade had gone up in flames in the end. Everyone died, but he alone survived. Counting the years, everyone, aside from his mom, had probably yet to be reincarnated. He didn't know whom he might run into if he was just kept walking like this. Then he thought of Xuemeng. He thought of Xuemeng's angry bellows as he tried to wrestle the soul-calling lantern from his hands, calling him a goddamn Scrooge. What right do you have? Have you no shame? Hugging the lantern to himself, Moran walked slower and slower until he stopped next to a wall, the rims of his eyes red despite his best efforts. He gazed at that gentle golden flame with his head lowered and muttered in a tiny voice, Shijun, is it that you, that you really don't want to go back with me? The flame didn't answer, only continued to burn silently. He stood there for a long time before he managed to calm back down. The underworld was so big and he didn't know where or whom he could go to. Then he suddenly thought of Chu Shun and hurriedly ran toward Tailwind Hall like he had grasped a lifeline. When he got there, Tailwind Hall was just about to close, and a masked ghost was shutting the doors and locking up. Moran hastily stopped him, entreating apprehensively, Sorry, but please wait! It's you? The masked person was the same one that had led him upstairs earlier. He paused for a moment, then said, What did you come back for? Sorry to trouble you, but it's urgent! Moran had ran too fast, he panted for breath, eyes bright yet anxious. He swallowed and said hoarsely, I want to see Sir Chu Shun again. Chu Shun was staring absently at a branch of high tongue blossoms in a slender white porcelain vase and was startled to suddenly see Moran return. Why did the little Gunsu come back? Were you unable to find him? Moran replied, I found him, but I, I... Chu Shun saw how tense and anxious he was and guessed that whatever trouble he had must be difficult to talk about, so he invited him in and closed the door, saying, Have a seat. Worried that Chu Shun might notice something off if he kept the so-calling lantern in his hands, Moran put it away in his Qian Kun pouch. It wasn't that he thought Chu Shun was a malicious ghost, but something like a living person sneaking into the underworld was best secret from the ghosts here if at all possible. The little Gunsu went to the southeast? Mmm, dot dot dot. Chu Shun thought for a moment, then said, It was the ailing soul sanitarium, wasn't it? Moran nodded and weighed his words before saying, I saw him at the ailing soul sanitarium, but it's an incomplete earth soul that can't speak or move. He even looks different from the other ghosts, half transparent, can be seen but can't be touched. Damaged earth souls are generally like that. Chu Shun's expression was somber. Some souls that have been agitated could even scatter, never to be gathered again. Moran chewed on his lip, then said hesitantly, The doctor there said that the people whose souls are incomplete will have certain impairments in life during their reincarnations, but the person I'm looking for was just fine in life, so I was wondering if there might have been a mistake somewhere. He paused for a while, lifting his head to look towards Chu Shun. Sir Chu, is it possible for someone to have two earth souls? Chu Shun faltered. Two earth souls? Mmm. Unlike the doctor at the ailing soul sanitarium who had immediately shot down Moran's hypothesis, Chu Shun mulled it over carefully for a while with his gaze downcast and then said, I suppose it isn't impossible. A tremor ran through Moran's body and his head snapped up, 
eyes bright in the dim candlelight of the room. Really? Shushin inclined his head. Normally, a person only has three ethereal souls and seven corporal souls, corporal spirits, but I once knew a woman with two cognizant souls. Could you tell me more? Chushun shook his head, his eyelashes dropping lower and trembling slightly. He took a moment to study himself before saying, It's all things long past now. I'd rather not talk about it. That person is suffering in the seventh level of hell right now. Anyone whose soul is abnormal, once found by Yan Lo, is sent to the seventh level to be slowly peeled apart. His words made Moran even more anxious, and in the dim light, he didn't notice the pain in Chushun's eyes when he asked, why does that woman have an extra cognizant soul? Normal people only need to gather their three souls after the seventh day, so if someone has an extra earth soul- Oh, wait, he's still talking, sorry, let me say that again. Why does that woman have an extra cognizant soul? Normal people only need to gather their three souls after the seventh day, so if someone has an extra earth soul, then would all four souls need to be gathered? That's probably the case. Then, the woman you mentioned- she was used by the Ninth King in death, forced back to the living world. Chu Shun paused, the slender fingers resting on his knee, slowly clenching into a fist. To the living world, she ate her own child alive. <gasps> oh no! That's his poor wife! His wife had two cognizant souls, and now she's being tortured in the seventh level of hell? Gasp. Moran suddenly recalled the past events of Lin An that he had borne witness to at the Peach Blossom Springs, and only then did he realize that the woman of whom Chu Shun spoke was actually his wife, that these were his most painful memories. Then, the reason Chu Shun had stayed at Nanka Village rather than reincarnate into his next life was to wait for his wife to be peeled of that extra soul and come back from the seventh hell to reunite with him. The seventh level to be reunited with him, so that they could reincarnate together. <gasps> oh. Oh, Chu Shun, he's waiting for his wife, but, but what about his child? Did his child, did his son reincarnate already? Moran couldn't bear to pry any more than he already had. Chu Shun said no more of it either. To mention something like this again, in just these few understated words, ate her own child alive. Even after 200 years, even as a ghost, his throat still trembled. He closed his eyes. The woman's soul became scrambled and torn, and fused with the child's cognizant soul. Ah, I see. A long while passed before he continued. So her extra soul so her extra soul is actually that child's cognizant soul that got stuck between hers, which slowly assimilated into her soul until it became a part of it, completely and inseparably. This person, in death as in life, always endured his own pain to help others. Moran felt horrible. He couldn't say it directly, and could only say, you don't have to say any more. I... I understand now. The reason I'm telling you these things is to let you know that if the Chu Gongzi you're looking for really does have two earth souls, then most likely one of them was not originally his. Moran turned it over in his head for a while, then asked, Is it not possible that it was one earth soul split into two? It's possible, but not in your case. Ah, so it's not a split soul. Chua Ning has someone else's earth soul? How come? Chu Shun explained. I've seen, a I've seen a soul split in two as well, but that's another story. Something like that generally only happens when someone has sinned so deeply and killed so wantonly that their souls are unable to bear it and shatter as a result. But even then, the one that shatters is always the human soul, which is responsible for morality and humanity, and never the, old s never the earth soul or the cognizant soul. I see, Moran muttered. He had already concluded th that this scenario had nothing to do with Chua Ning as soon as he heard sinned so deeply and killed so wantonly. But as for himself, on the other hand, he wondered, when he truly meets his end in this life and comes to the underworld, will his human soul shatter into two? Will he get his just desserts? Chu Shun added, besides, if it really was one soul split into two, then the other half of the earth soul would have been, able, but would have been unable to walk and gotten sent to the ailing soul sanitarium as well. Since the little Gongzi only saw one damaged earth soul there, then I think the other one should be a complete healthy soul. Moran lit up immediately at his remark as things clicked into place, and he said in a hurry, Thank you so much, Sir Chu. Then I... I'll go back to searching right now. Very good. Aside from pointing toward the ailing soul sanitarium earlier, the compass also pointed in the northeast direction. 
the little Gongzi should try going in that direction. Though, Nanko Village is vast, with so many ghosts coming and going while waiting their turn to reincarnate. Chu Shun sighed. Moran saw those gentle eyes tinged faintly with pity, and already knew what he wanted to say. The vastness of Nanko Village, the millions of wandering ghosts, even knowing the direction, it would be no easy task to find one particular Earth soul. If two people were not fated, then even if the streets were so brightly lit it appeared not to be night at all, they would still brush right past one another as they walked, one toward the east and one toward the west, never once noticing the other, never even seeing the other. And with the underworld silent as it was now, it was even easier said than done. But Chu Shun was a gentle soul in the end. He lifted his head and clapped Moran on the shoulder. The little Gongzi has such heartfelt sincerity, you will surely meet him again. He looked so much like Chu Ming, and as he spoke, a bead of melted wax dripped slowly down and the candle flame flickered, making his face look even more indistinct. In the dimness, Moran seemed to see Chu Ming's face in a moment of gentleness, seemed to hear Chu Ning say to him that they will meet again. Wetness gathered in Moran's eyes despite himself. He hurriedly lowered his head and clasped his hands in a gesture of respect, voice hoarse as he said, Really, thank you so much. But Chu Shun said nothing in response. Even when Moran had already turned and left, closing the door behind him, he was still standing there staring after him, a hint of bewilderment flickering in his phoenix eyes. Were those tears he saw? In that young man's eyes? Ghosts couldn't cry. Did he see wrong? Or... He turned to look over his shoulder at that quietly blooming branch of high tang blossoms in the vase. Flowers from the living world couldn't bear the yin energy of the underworld. Even with careful tending, a petal had, yet, a petal had still drifted down to land on the aged wooden table. Chu Shun walked over and picked up that vibrant petal. It withered and crumbled away in no time, scattering from his fingertips into powder. Guard. Sir Chu! A masked person came in immediately, standing respectfully to the side. Chu Shun didn't turn around. He gazed at the high tongue blossoms as he asked in a soft voice, Has that person come to Tailwind Hall himself recently? No, he hasn't. Things have been the same as always. A branch of high tongue blossoms every ten days. He dares not come here to Tailwind Hall himself, and always has someone else deliver it for him. Dot dot dot. What is it, sir? Was there something off about that Gongzo just now? If that person dares send people to bother you, you can always ask Lord Yanlo to... No. Chu Shun broke out of his daze and interrupted him, turning to smile lightly at his, at his subordinate. He exhaled. It's nothing. He probably wasn't sent by that person. And even if he was, that child came only to look for someone. It had nothing to do with me. But that person did send him here. But if that person did send him here, then why did you still go to the trouble... He had no involvement in that wrong. Chu Shun stood quietly next to the flowering branch, his robes the color of snow. Let him be. The streets were desolate. Moran left Tailwind Hall and headed northeast, going door to door with Chu Anning's portrait, but it was like trying to find a needle at the bottom of the sea. Those he showed the portrait to waved their hands. No, some didn't even want to look at it at all before walking past him. The person in the drawing never seen him before. Haven't seen him, haven't seen him. Don't interrupt my business. Get out of my way. So damn annoying. Do you not see what time it is? Piss off. What portrait? Get out of my face. Although the residents of Nanka Village, of Nanka Village were all ghosts, these ghosts had yet to sever their emotions and desires. Living together like this, most of them had gradually settled back into how they used to spend their days in the living world. While waiting out their 8 to 10 long years, they would seek out some friends or relatives, or else adopt a dead cat or a dead dog. Simply put, they lived as they had when they were still alive. And so, although they did not need to sleep, they would still lie down in their beds to rest when the moon climbed high up in the sky. With the night falling, even fewer people were willing to talk to him, and no one had any information or direction for him. He walked by himself down that long, endless street stretching into the northeast, knocking on every door and visiting every house, keeping his head down while smiling apologetically. I already told you, I saw it wrong. I thought about it more, and the person I saw actually wasn't the one in the drawing. Can you just leave me alone already? The bearded man was getting ready to retire for the night with his wife and kids of the underworld, trying to close the door. Moran had run into him on the street earlier as he'd, come, as he'd been coming back, and had asked if he had seen the person in the portrait. 
He thought for a while and then said that he seemed to remember seeing him around the East Market a couple days ago. But then his wife had thrown him a look and he'd shut up immediately as if realizing something and started waving his hands and insisting he didn't know anything. But Moran felt like he did know, so he had refused to give up, following him the whole way home and pleading with him the entire time. The man shoved him brusquely out the door and pulled the wooden door bolt. Moran begged frantically, Could you please think about it again? Where in the East Market? And where did he go after? Please! I don't know! The commotion drew the attention of nearby ghosts, and a crowd had gathered to watch. The man bellowed loudly and angrily as he tried to shut the door, heedless of the fact that Moran's hand was still in the doorframe. The door slammed roughly on his fingers. It was excruciating, but he couldn't care about that right now, swallowing the pain and refusing to pull his hand from the closing gap, using all of his strength to push it open instead. I'm begging you, please think about it again! I just want to know where he went after that! But the man abruptly wrenched the door open and, taking no notice of the blood welling up on Moran's fingers, shoved him roughly backwards and yelled, I already said I don't know! F off! Ah, okay, end of chapter 109. So, to recap this chapter, Moran heads back to Chu Shun um, to ask him if it's possible that there, that uh, Chua Ning's earth soul could have been split in half, but Chu Shun said that it's not possible. Um, because he has first-hand experience, uh, and it turns out Chu Shun's actual, actu um, Chu Shun's own wife had actually two cognizant souls because after she killed and ate her child, uh, both her soul and her child's soul fused together and became two cognizant souls. So, um, Chu Shun is actually down in the underworld waiting for his, his wife's soul to be done in the seventh level of hell so they can go and reincarnate together. So, Chu Shun has a, just a really sad backstory, guys. Um, his son's soul has been absorbed by his wife's soul, and his wife is being peeled away in the seventh layer of hell. Oh my gosh. Um, but yeah, uh, Chu Shun gives Moran some suggestions about what could be going on, and he even believes that Chuan Ning's other earth soul could be really healthy and located in the northeast, because that is the other direction that the compass pointed at before. So Moran is heading that way, uh, but it's very vague general uh, general direction, so he has to ask around. Um, but yeah, also, what I'm quite curious about is the high tongue blossom tree branch that Chu Shun keeps looking at. He talked about it having been brought by someone every 10 days. Who is this person that keeps delivering it? Hmm. Anyway, uh, Moran bumped into someone in town, and he has suspicions that this person may have spotted Chua Ning, but they're lying to him and hiding that information. Why is that? What are they scared of? Is someone threatening them? Who knows? <laughs> a lot of mysteries! Um, but all we do know is that Moran is going in the right direction, and hopefully in the next few chapters, he will reunite with Shijun's other Earth Soul. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed today's read-along, and I will see you guys next time. Bye-bye!